from your half to full marathon, how to survive and thrive with Rick Mirabella. Welcome to the Run Smarter Podcast, the podcast helping you overcome your current and future running injuries by educating and transforming you into a healthier, stronger, and smarter runner. My name is Brody Sharp. I am the guy to reach out to when you've finally decided enough is enough with your persistent running injuries. I'm a physiotherapist, the owner of the Breakthrough Running Clinic, and your podcast host. I'm excited to bring you today's lesson and to add to your ever-growing running knowledge. Let's work together to overcome your running injuries, getting you to that starting line and finishing strong. So let's take it away. As you probably already know, I do love listening to podcasts, several different podcasts, um, with that being running podcasts as well. And I first heard about Rick on his own podcast. It's Runners Radio, and that's R-U-N-N-E-Z or Z, so Runners Radio. And I loved his interview style. I loved the type of people he was interviewing. I first listened to his interview with Peter Maliaris, who I've also interviewed on my podcast and just loved his style. So I thought I'd reach out and you've probably figured out that I'm also collaborating with a lot of other podcast hosts um, throughout my own podcast. I do this in a couple of ways. One, it's great to cross promote audiences. Two, the hosts have a real wealth of information and three, I love listening to podcasts. I love finding out more and more Um, or discovering more podcasts to listen to. And whenever I listen to a podcast that is in the same alignment, um, I do love going over to another podcast and having a listen to them as well. So um, it's a good chance to offer you guys another podcast to listen to, especially if they are well-versed, if they're well-educated, if they have a really good interview style, and if they're still delivering a wealth of information because that's what this is all about. It's all about finding the right type of information and making sure we're not getting confused with the mixed messages that are out there. So Rick, Rick is the founder and head coach of Runners and he has his website, runners.com. He is, um, like I said, the head coach. He's coached thousands of endurance athletes of all levels around the globe. And yeah, like I said, he's the host of Runners Radio Podcast. So if you love his knowledge, I think we really, we work together really well because when it comes to training plans, thresholds, um, working in a really nice training plan, it's not really my forte. Um, I love the injury side of things, educating people about injuries, overcoming their running injuries, increasing their performance. But when it comes to race preparation, um, which is why I had Jason Fitzgerald on as well. It's kind of, um, I'd, I'd love to know more about it. And you just have a, a, when you just listen to Rick and listen to his knowledge, uh, you can tell that there's a lot of experience that um, comes from that. So we thought we'd come together. We thought we'd have two different topics today. Um, one being the tips when preparing or trying to complete a half marathon PB. And the second topic being um, how to successfully jump from a half marathon to a full marathon. So we thought we'd do uh, six tips. (laughs) Um, He'd write down three and I'd write down three for both of those topics. And then we would just rattle them off back and forth and discuss and collaborate and um, get each other's thoughts on each of them. Uh, I know six tips is a bit weird, but I know five tips is nicer, but then that means it'd be uneven for us. And um, if we went up to say 10, 10 would be way too many. So I settled on six. I hope that's okay for uh, most of those people out there. But what this interview really entails is like, there's a lot of value, just rapid fire back and forth, back and forth. So uh, Pay attention, try not to to zone out because there is a lot of wealth of information throughout this whole entire podcast. And yeah, so if you're looking to race or get a half marathon PB, or if you're looking to finally make that leap from half marathon to full marathon, it's a big jump. Um, This is going to be very, very helpful for you. So without further ado, here is myself and Rick uh, talking about 
all things half and full marathon. Rick, I've got two exciting topics today and we've sort of collaborated, we've put together our own tips and we're probably just going to rattle off one tip after another. Um, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on my topics as well or what I've got written down. So we're going to jump in with our six tips when preparing for a half marathon or pro- trying to get your half marathon PB. Uh, why don't you start off with your tip and then I'll follow suit. Fantastic, bro. It's hey, one of my favourite subjects this because the half marathon is a real it's a prestigious distance and it's a distance that um, so many people worldwide really see on their, on their bucket list to want to attack. And often once you've done a couple, you really start thinking, well, how fast can I go? So I think for the biggest thing, in my opinion, is to be running at different speeds for most of the year. So we, we obviously want to be touching on specific paces, which is race paces. We want to be touching on paces above race pace, which is VO2 pace and lactate threshold stuff. So you want to be getting uncomfortable once or twice a week, especially in that 16-week specific phase. But really important that people probably miss, and as, a, as a, an expert in the field, bro, you, you would know this, is people forget to do their easy running, their recovery running, their slow running, and all that kind of stuff, which is bloody crucial. So touching on different paces um, and not falling into that grey zone or that consistent moderate stuff, which is a surefire way to plateau, great man. What do you think about that one? Yeah, it's good. And it's, it's good that we have your um, expertise coming from that field as well, because I don't really do much work with lactate thresholds and heart rates and all that kind of stuff. So if someone was to uh, work out what zones to be in, uh, if we're looking at a half marathon PB, would you suggest that people select what their, like their A goal is and what pace that needs to be and then work their training around that, whether it be above or below race pace? Yeah, it's obviously very general, but yeah, certainly your goal race pace, um, let's just say we're 16 weeks out. Let's pick, let's pick an hour, 28, so 88 minutes. Okay, let's pick 28. So what do you got, about four, 405 pace roughly. You don't have to be specific on that race pace yet, but you might have a date pace, so the current pace that you can run a half marathon, let's say it's, a, it's an hour 32, an hour 34. Um, you would use those race paces as your specific uh, sessions at the moment. With heart rate zones and that, Look, there's definitely got its place, but I definitely prefer to be on feel a lot more. But the main thing, Brody, if, you, if the listeners can just tailor in, and I'm sure they'll have a coach or a program of some sort, but their real quality session of the week, they almost want to be like in zone four, zone five for a fair chunk of that. So above half marathon pace, I'd be saying. So um, I'd be looking at more your 5K race to even 3,000 metre race pace, which is going to be... Like a, they're going to be north of 165, 170 beats per minute for a, a fair bit of that session. Um, so they don't have to worry too much. If your goal pace might be 405, um, you're not going to be touching on 405 in your specific race pace. Just get, worry, worry about getting uncomfortable in the early phase and then recovery running. And then closer to the event, four weeks, three weeks, five weeks out, broads, you'd be looking at doing a lot of work at 405. Uh, on some of your long runs and, and just making 405 feel really comfortable. Um, and, and that would have been the case if you've been doing the hard stuff um, and your interval stuff, your fart legs, your aerobic powers at 350, 345 and 405 for an hour and a half isn't too much of a stretch. And if let's just say you, you mentioned the importance of doing slow Ks as well. If mm. someone is 16 weeks out, how like, volume wise or percentage wise what would you say would be under race pace above race pace and at race pace great stuff so 16 weeks out if you've got a 405 goal you're currently running a half marathon at about 410 to 415 pace um you won't be running too much of your sunday running at 415 you you, depends on the week clearly but as a general rule on field again 16 weeks from half marathon you would have done your quality session Tuesday or Wednesday. That would have been intervals or fartleks or, or track work. Your Sunday run or your Saturday run, you can be anywhere from, from 4.30 to 5 minutes flat. It's purely just capillary work. It's about getting time on legs in that, in that early phase. So you're not going to be touching on too much specific race pace on a long run 16 weeks out. I like to throw in at least three or four specific long runs uh, in that eight week, nine week time, like final session, that that makes sense, buddy. Yeah, really cool. And so I guess what the underlying message is like people tend to, or sometimes without the guidance can um, tend to drift into that gray zone where they're not really doing any hard sessions or they're 
too sore to do any hard sessions or they um, they want to keep pushing for their lighter sessions. But if you have structure and if you have that, um, if you're eliminating kind of that gray zone merge, you're taking the full benefit out of your slow mileage. You're getting full benefit out of those faster paces and allowing that structure and it helps just the variety and helps the body um, adapt to different physiological changes with the paces. Is that right? So true. And I know, I know this first one or two, we're going to be on a bit longer because they're, they're so important. But if the listeners can take one thing out of it, it is you've got to be running at different paces. And if it's good enough for all the elites, it's certainly good enough for us um, general pop or age group runners, because you certainly don't have to be trying to hit a, a pace 16 weeks out um, just because it looks good on Strava. So the elite runners, like let's just use uh, an elite marathon, maybe a 210, 208 guy, even Kit Chogi, like a 202, 201 guy. Um, he obviously, race pace is 250 odd, but some of their long runs are 440s. Okay, so that's, that's what's that nearly two minutes per kilometer slower than marathon race pace. Now, we don't have to be at that extreme, but we need to be um, deriving the most benefit on our long runs as well. So every Sunday or Saturday should not be a race until you've got that, those three or four really key sessions. Um, that we put in nine, eight, seven weeks out from race day. And of course, maybe 21 days out as well, but certainly not 16 weeks. Um, all, all your listeners, bros, let's just worry about building money in the bank, building that easy mileage on a Sunday and deriving the breathless sessions on a Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah. And that, that segues really well into my, my point with trying to improve your half marathon PB was just to be to build up mileage and build up a lot of slow Ks under the belt, building a bigger base and adapting to that bigger base. And a lot of people don't realize that in order to become faster, one of the ways to become fast is actually to do a lot more slow Ks and uh, increase your weekly mileage. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's so good. And from a physiological point of view, it's gold. Um, because we need to increase our capillaries, our mitochondria at different at different paces, okay? And we need to really build up that uh, muscular endurance as well. Like if you're going to run a half marathon on your legs for 21.1K, my next tip I'll get to in a minute is the over-training, over-distance training. What Brody just said then is absolutely spot on. Um, and the thing on that, mate, is just running more and running more frequently, which I know you, I think you might touch on later. It, it doesn't have to be all running one go on a Saturday and then wait till Wednesday to run. Um, especially you beginners, like you can, you can just get out there a bit more consistently. Um, 20, 30 minutes of slow running is gold. Um, I will say if you are running, if you feel like you're always running slow as well, just throw in five or six 50 yard strides at the end of a slow run. And from a neuromuscular and coordination level, that's gold as well. So, um, but I couldn't agree more, Brody. Too many people are running in that gray zone, unfortunately. And the easiest way to plateau and not see performance results is always running um, at a medium pace, not a, at a really slow or really fast pace. Yeah. I think people can be a bit impatient as well. And I was just li- listening to the strength running podcast this morning on my run. And Jason was saying that like somewhere along the lines of patience, isn't that sexy, but it's necessary. And in order to build that bigger base and allow the body to adapt, you do need a lot of time. And you, you touched on the key word there is consistency. Well, consistency is number one. And that's why people like me and you, um, I guess, we're in business because we have to keep people consistent. And in endurance sport, or in most things in life that are worth working for, um, consistency and patience in the long game is key. And look, you're right. Jason's right. Um, It's not sexy, but um, the results and the way you feel are are just worth every single minute of patience. So I always say, like, if you've got a 10 year training age and if you can put 10 years of continuity, down for me, uh, you'll get the results that you you come here for. But if you keep having three weeks off, six weeks off, uh, keep getting injured because you're not listening to your doctors or physios or coaches, um, then you unfortunately you won't probably hit the results that you've been after. Good point. Okay, what's our next tip that we have written down? Well, my, mine was over distance training, and remember that we are training for a PB. So if you are a beginner training for your first mar- half marathon, sorry. Um, you might not be going over the distance, which just means running over the, the race distance. So the half marathon, it's really important that you're running over that distance for a PB. Um, and look, if you're looking to break two and a half hours, probably not. But if you're looking to break an hour 30, you've got to be put in um, at least two or three runs well over that distance. But to your point earlier, it doesn't necessarily have to be at race pace either. So you could be a lot slower. So if you're looking at a 405, we'll keep using this um, imaginary 405 runner 
um, you, you might be doing uh, four weeks out, a 24 to 25K run. It might work out to be at 420s and surges in there. And, and then maybe um, 21 days out, you, you'll you do another two-hour run at, say, 24K. Just building that mileage. And then, again, from a psychological, but physiological view as well, you bring back and you go, geez, how easy is 21K? Uh, and you can. You can turn the screws a little bit on pace. So that's really important because we, we are, at the end of the day, endurance athletes. And if we're not... If we're not running, if 21 is our ceiling and we have never gone over that, then how do we expect to run it fast? Yeah, I, I want to add a little bit onto that and the benefits of that over distance is the mental side of things as well because a lot of people tend to create like a rigid goal that they set. And let's just say someone's running for a 10K and all of a sudden they're just like, oh, I'm halfway there. Oh, I'm three quarters away there. Oh, I have three Ks to go, you know, two Ks to go. Mm-hmm. They kind of self-talk themselves and create that ceiling for themselves. Whereas if you're, if you're say running a half marathon and that's a goal, a stretch goal for you, if you can mentally put yourself in the uh, mind that you're running a full marathon, then that's going to be over quickly. And mentally you're going to um, deal with it, manage it a lot more effectively. And if you are, over training or if you're training and going over that distance mentally you're calming yourself down instead of like um you know that negative self-talk of i'm halfway there okay three quarters away the there Let, let's keep pushing and then um end up talking yourself out of it whereas if you know cool. that you're capable of going further then it, it calms down the mind a bit as well absolutely perfect and it is the way so let's just put a put aside physiological benefits because they're, they're absolutely golden but from a psychological perspective, it makes everything so much easier. Um, the biggest thing I always tell most of my athletes is if you're wishing it away or you're wishing the time away, it's, you're on a hiding to nothing and it's a surefire way to fail. So if you're at 14K going, okay, only 7K to go, only 7K to go, and you, you, even though you might be on the edge of okay, half marathon PB, you are on the edge of threshold, or you are on that edge of redlining, but you still should be able to say, yeah, I, I could run 30K at this pace if I wanted to. Okay, so we're talking PBs today. That is the key to be on the threshold, but just say, no, no, I can definitely hold this for longer. So I want to go longer. You're almost forcing yourself to go longer. Like you say, yeah, you can, so you're convincing your brain, you're turning your brain, say, I could run 30K at this. So that's, that's a great point, bro. Yeah, awesome. Uh, my next point I had was strength training. And there, I know that everyone rolls their eyes. A lot of runners don't like strength training, but science comes into it when strength training once or twice a week and doing it really, really well. While structures and progressive actually helps running efficiency, it helps running economy, it helps running performance. So uh, it's a great tip for people to have um, and a great thing to implement twice a week. Maybe make sure that you have the right guidance, make sure you have a a running coach or a personal trainer or a physio um, structuring it for you to make sure your technique and your dosages are all correct. But have you seen... um, some good results with strength training with your runners yeah thanks bro you uh, your ebook's fantastic i flicked through that last week and i've done that for 15 years mate we've got a pretty um sweet s and c setup uh out here in bayside so it's 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 absolutely crucial and look it's it's not the same for every athlete so you don't there's not one size fits all but you know that if you can fit in the big five or six movements uh look on average twice a week or three times a fortnight for 20 to half an hour um, you're going to, look, what you said, running economy, okay, uh, recruiting all the muscle fibres, efficiency, but again, robust injury-proof runners. So go back to that continuity that we spoke about. And if you're not doing it and you're getting up in your mileage, 60, 70, 80K a week, and you're not doing any form of lifting, um, unfortunately, it's only a matter of time because what some of the, like, you'd know more than me, mate, but look, the soleus and these kind of muscles look seven times your body weight every time you take a step, 180 steps a minute. Uh, you're on the if you're on your legs for two hours, that's a lot of body weight through those those lower limbs. So um, crucial. Um, and I don't know if we've got time to go for the big movements, but um, I'm not sure that's that they could probably put a whole another show together on that. <laughs> yeah, I have had a couple of episodes in the past. If people want to refer back to that as well, but yeah, it's just making crucial. yourself a more robust runner. It's making sure that all those like you're ticking all the boxes to become more resilient and you might not have to start off doing six exercises twice a week. Cause that might be overwhelming, particularly if you haven't done it before, but you can, you can start small and you will see, see the benefits if you do start small with 
two exercises, maybe just do some lunges, maybe just do some squats and progressively increase that spe- uh, increase the weights or increase the speed and implement some sort of plyometrics. Start from there it's, and then grow on it, grow on it, grow on it until you get to that five, six movements. Totally, totally agree. Don't build it up to be something it's not. Every rep I'm doing in the weights room is about my running or back when I played other sport like footy, like running and performance and just general continuity is why we're in the weights room. Look, some sessions you'll end up really enjoying, but if you find that you're not a big fan of it, just remember why you're doing it and just like definitely employ like a Brody Sharp or, or an expert in the field because the last thing you want to be doing, this is my last bit on this, Brody, is, is uh, unfortunately going to someone who doesn't understand uh, biomechanics or physiology or performance and you end up doing a thousand contacts a thousand bloody plyometrics for the sake of it and you think that you're getting stronger but unfortunately you're probably doing yourself a disservice there love it rick uh what else have we got what's the next tip well my, mine was continuity is a must which we've spoke about already a lot so it's just it's just that that important um that if you're looking at a 2020 or 2021 half marathon pb that you just remember to be consistent that you don't have to um, shoot the house down every week and go look at my performance every week. It's not about that. It's just continuously getting out there. The hardest steps, that first one out the door. And once you're out, you are flying. Awesome. The next tip that I have written down was lighter shoes. If used appropriately and transitioned appropriately, um, pretty much because if we're working on a half marathon PB, it has shown that lighter shoes do increase running economy and can help performance. So I thought it was a nice little tip if someone hasn't really considered it, if they haven't weighed their shoes. Uh, what I will add to that is that if someone was to go to lighter shoes, generally speaking, they're less supportive or generally speaking, they do require a bit more foot strength, ankle strength, calf strength. So you want to make sure that that transition is gradual and you want to make sure that the body has adapted to that lighter shoe. But um, I know personally, um, I love running in lighter shoes. I have minimalist shoes that I run most of my runs in unless my calves are really sore or um, my foot's playing up or something like that. But I've built up a lot of like K's in them to get stronger and get a bit more resilient with them. Have you seen any experience with lighter shoes? Yeah, mate, but uh, exactly what you're saying. We're talking to someone who might be after a PB. So hopefully they've done a little bit of running already. They've, they've done a bit of strength work and yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I like to tell my guys to at least have two or three different models on the go. Um, and it does allow different tissue to adapt and that kind of stuff and tendons, of course, all um, and connective tissue, but the biggest thing there is, yeah, you're gonna. We're talking about a sub ninety or a, or a sub one forty, or you, shoes are, are worth nearly a minute or more sometimes, ninety seconds maybe. So it's a no brainer to go for racing flats, or of course all these um, companies now. Like you've got the Nike Next Percent, you got um, what do we got? The um, this got released this week, the Asics and the Adidas, and there's there's all the carbon fiber ones. So the Endorphin Plus from Soconi. So there's there's lots of different. Uh, racing shoes out there um so yeah like, my advice would be like maybe a heavier trainer uh maybe a mid a mid weight like a, 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 a like a mid weight shoe and then your very lightest one for racing and track work and, and reps awesome and uh i think that's our six tips for that i will do a little quick recap and then we'll move on to our next topic so make sure you're working out different variety with your speeds make sure you're building up your overall like slow k mileage train like do your over distance training, do some strength training, make sure you establish that continuity and wear some lighter shoes. So some great tips. Our next topic that we wanted to discuss was jumping someone transitioning from a half marathon. So someone's quite confident with that pace and that distance and then wants to transition to the full. And I think, you know, a lot of runners, they just want to keep, keep stretching themselves, keep stretching themselves. So they'll probably go from the full to the ultra. We see everyone just keeps striving, keep striving. So um, yeah, looking forward to these tips. What do you have as tip number one for transitioning to the full? Yeah. Well, like you said, people do want to challenge themselves and the marathon is, is one of my, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, the finish line of a marathon is a beautiful thing. And, and the training process for a marathon. But the biggest thing is to probably build that base. Um, and what does that actually mean? It, it, a lot of this is what I'm going to talk about. It goes go back to what we've already spoken about. But the base is just being able to be on your legs for long periods of time before you even start a specific phase. So let's call the last three to four months your, your specific prep. 
But if the listeners are thinking about stepping up to the marathon distance, uh, look, at least make sure you can be on your legs for 90 minutes, 70 to 80 to 90 minutes without having to stop too much. Okay? If you can do that consistently, um, you'll be able to start a 16-week plan. Um, but the base does include different paces as well. Um, so that's back to my, my previous point 15 minutes ago. The base doesn't mean all slow running, and it certainly doesn't mean all fast running. Too, too often uh, with this one, Broads, people step up to the marathon and they just think he's got to run slow and long and then they get into the opposite of what we're talking about before they just, they just become slow because they're, they're just not so you definitely got to be working those different energy systems midweek at least once so touch in on those those paces of 5k race pace 3k race pace but the base is simply just running and being able to hold it for 70 80 minutes and then we can step in a bit more specificity great man what do you got for me yeah, that's cool. Can I just follow up? Like if we're building a base and our time on legs, do you have any recommendations on weekly mileage before someone's kind of ready for a marathon? Thanks. That's a great tip because there's two things I'll get on that. You've reminded me of something. So look, not really. If it depends on the pace, so it depends on the, the race pace one day. It's their very first marathon and they want to start a plan. So let's just say, call the plan 16 weeks. You'd like to think they could, you know, already running 25 to 30 kilometers a week. It sounds not much, but we're going to build them right up. Okay, so if you're starting from zero, try to build up to 25, 30k a week. Um, with a little bit of that being your intervals or your your repetition work or your hill or your fartleks, and a little bit of that being your long run. And like I spoke about earlier, a couple of easy jogs in there as well. What we want to avoid, especially beginners or for anyone really, is running too much of our percentage of miles on a Sunday or a Saturday. Um, because if you're stepping up to 25k runs on a Sunday and you're only running once or twice a week apart from that, not ideal either. So um, 25 to 30k a week, Brody, if you can run that, you can commence your probably week one of a 16-week plan. Yeah, that's really cool. And it, it's a good starting point. Well, at least it's very um, generic, but it's good for people to have that frame of mind that you need at least 30ks a week to start to have enough, enough legs to start a, a training plan. So that's really cool. And well, did I hear in there you're recommending if someone was to build a base to start like doing more like frequent running more frequently throughout the week. So it's very harder. It's a lot harder to build up mileage if you do a long run on weekends than once or twice during the week. Um, so you want to try and get more runs in uh, more frequently throughout the week. Yes. And obviously with um, their physio or, or, or coach's advice. But certainly the, the general rule of thumb is, look, if you, can, if you can run four times a week, five times, like it doesn't have to be fast. Like we said, we can have one quality workout and then the rest can be 20, 30-minute jogs. And, and then the, the long one obviously will be will be closer to that, that uh, maybe 15, 16 pound a weekend, which is initial phase, obviously. But yeah, we don't want to be, um, for many reasons, but there's a lot of physical reasons but just that continuity on the muscle tissue it, if you're trying to run so say people have a 40k goal for that week and they, they go and run 25 of them on a sunday um chances are they're not going to be ready for that from a physical and biomechanical standpoint and that, that's a really quick fire way to get injured whereas if they're just building up their tissue and they've they've run four or five times a week most of them are jogging for six weeks um roads that you're, you're going to be ready to step up the mileage on a sunday um, so it's, your, your body's not is, is in much shock going. Now I've got to run for two and a half hours when I haven't. I've only run four times in the last two weeks. So it's just about regularly getting out the door and jogging. Um, and it's a word that in marathon terms gets used a lot. So don't be afraid to just jog regularly. Um, consecutive days are fine if you're ready for it. But even just make it every second day. Every second day I'm out there jogging. Gold, absolute gold. Um, my tip that I had in was when jumping to the full, you need to factor in a lot of like nutrition and fueling. And I've got like um, on my belt, I've only got one marathon. I've done uh, several halves, but going to that full, um, I should probably mention, I've got a funny story. Like when I was doing a couple of halves, I was like training in winter and racing in winter. I didn't really need a lot of fuel. Didn't really need a lot of water. Like I was running half marathons without ever stopping at drink stations. And I thought that was fine. Then when I got to 
running the full marathon, I thought I'd be sensible and it was a little bit warmer as well. So I was stopping at every drink station, taking a little bit in, but I just didn't know what to do. And I hadn't trained to like, you know, sip while you're jogging. I was just choking on water the whole time, but then <laughs> tried some gels, never tried a gel before in my life and it was disgusting. And I threw it out and then I was just struggling through the last say 10 K um, because I was so depleted and I don't know much about this topic, like nutrition and fueling isn't really my forte. So um, I'm not too sure how much experience you have with this, but I'm curious to know your thoughts. Yeah, well, like I've got 15 years of experience in the field, but I'm certainly no uh, dietitian, but I, I, I've obviously through practice and I've got a couple of people I refer on to for this kind of stuff when it's specific issues. But as a general rule, it's same as anything, practice, practice, practice. So um, my marathoners, whether they're in Melbourne or all over the world, they, they will definitely practice their nutrition six or seven times on a long run. Um, and even if they are only going, say, 30K or two hours or two and a half hours, uh, I want them practicing their routine. And that, not just not on race day, that's the 24, 36 hours in the lead up as well. So whether it's getting the right amount of uh, glycogen in, whether it's getting the right amount of fluid in, because everyone's different as well. Okay, and some people can handle a two-hour run in the heat without taking a sip. Whether it's going to be beneficial for the performance, probably not. Uh, but exactly what you said, Brody, um, your first marathon, you want to make sure exactly what you're putting in, 48 hours, 24 hours. So you want to know everything that's going to be in your digestive system. You certainly want to be experienced with gels. <laughs> gels, uh, <laughs> look, they're, they're very, they're very um, what's the word, polarizing. I love them. Um, but other people can't stand them. And if you have your first one on race day, that's, that's going to be an issue. You could be running the toilet or, or worse. Um, and yeah, certainly take learning to take on water. Uh, in Australia, our climates are so diverse that, like you said, you're probably training most of your long runs in four degrees Celsius. But then if you look at a Melbourne marathon, you, you could get a 25 degrees Celsius day in October. Gold Coast is even worse. The humidity when you go up in July is crazy. Um, so the people have been undone many times and that's where practice just comes in. I, I think I can write um, a, a whole entire page worth of the mistakes I did for my first marathon and the gels just came in my race kit and I thought, oh, sweet, let me, <laughs> let me put them in my pockets. <laughs> so what you're saying is, um, we want to try and mimic race day as much as possible where with the fueling and hydration and, um, timing of like taking the gels and things and you kind of want to trial and error because everyone is different. Everyone responds differently. You want to make sure that you're confident um, while you go through that trial and error phase. So yeah, to succinct it, that's it. Just just practice, practice. Look, there is a lot of reading you can do. There's experts. Like, uh, there's a fellow out at Monash Clayton, who's, his name's Dr. Christopher Roush, who, who um, you literally get on the treadmill for two hours, two and a half hours, and he tests you every 15 minutes. He'll come up with a pretty, um, what's the word? pretty individual plan for you on race day, but look, you can get that from seven or eight long runs just practicing. So I don't overthink it, but certainly be confident in what you're going to do on race day. Nice. What do we have next? My one is, well, my one for the marathon is look, just exactly what we spoke about the diet there. Repetition is king. So just continuing to, to do the work. So don't try not to miss too many long runs. I often say um, if you've got a 16 week plan in front of you, that's individually built. Obviously, you adapt it each week if you coach or your trainer, but um, try not to miss those long runs, okay? But, um, there's an old coach called Bill Squires in the States who just said the long run is what puts the tiger in the cat, and it's so true for distance running. Um, some people really like the fast stuff, and, and I guess we've made a, a business specifically out of, out of the VO2 type training and that kind of stuff, but as a marathon, mate, the long run is king. So... Um, repetition is king and if you've got 16 long runs on your program um, even if you're crook or something obviously don't run if you're crook or a bit niggly but try to just get one long run in a week if you can obviously circumstances aren't always gonna you know um, meet in but yeah long run is king repetition is king and just on that um, learning how it feels to be on your legs for three hours is, is really important so 21 days out we usually do our longest run um, as a rule, so it depends on the athlete. But if it's a beginner, there, there's a little bit of time to spend at their goal pace. But it's just being on time, on legs for three hours. Yeah, I think I might skip my my next tip and go back to it because um, it ties in really well with my last point, which um, kind of takes from another approach. And I've wrote down here like you need to listen to your body and sometimes know when to take a day off and when to to push on. And if you have 
the expectations like not every day is going to feel like fresh. You're not going to wake up jumping out of bed, but um, sometimes when going from that half marathon to full marathon, when there's a lot of K's, there's a lot of long runs, um, listening to your body and trying to accurately interpret what your body's telling you. Uh, and if you're lacking in recovery, if you're not getting enough sleep or maybe nutrition, it, it might be something you need to pay attention to and maybe something that the body is signaling to you. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely spot on. So in our all our quality sessions, the actual runners sessions that people listen to when they're ears, when they're out running, they it's all done on field, Brody. So and it's so the same goes for the long run. If you need a recovery day, you take a recovery day. If your ninety percent PRE that should be five uh, k race pace is nowhere near that on that session, well, that's where you're at today. Um, and well, Kanisa Bakili said it as well. He said it for years, and this is I've done this model for fifteen years. Your ninety percent will be very different week to week um, and you're going to feel very differently week to week and that goes for long run days as well take rest days take recovery take sleep days Brody will probably go into it later but recovery is king so if you're not recovering um, you've just you've got to get that right otherwise you're not going to go anywhere yeah and if we were to try and like maybe combine those two tips like your last one I think it's recognizing the like if repetition is king it's recognizing the importance of your long run so maybe if you're listening to your body your body's telling you maybe to take a rest day just reschedule that long run don't skip that long run make sure you're Mm. recognizing the value and it, it might just take okay let me swap out a day maybe let's just get my easy day on tuesday and let's do it on sunday and let me do my long run later in the week and try and um manipulate the program based on what your body's telling you Perfect you advice. You can't, it's not going to, nothing is going to go exactly to plan ever. So if you have got a coach or a physio or someone you can talk to, um, definitely. But even if you haven't, you definitely trust your body and trust the way it's, it, it will tell you what to do. If you if you wake up on a Saturday and it's not there, just stay in bed because sleep, sleep is king. And your marathon training, you need to be bloody sleeping as well. So miss an easy run, even miss a quality workout, miss a session, just be a long run on Wednesday. Whatever it is, I agree. Totally agree, mate. Cool. Um, whose turn is it? I think it might be yours for the, the next tip. This will be my last one for the marathon. You can call in whatever you need from me. But most important in life, any marathon, it's a great uh, metaphor for life, the marathon. But love the process and love the journey. Um, because if you're not enjoying it, uh, it's going to be very bloody tough. Because like you said, so many long runs in the middle of winter. Um, so many hard uh, marathon pace workouts or long hilly runs for two, two and a half hours. We need to change the brain and say, yeah, we love this. It's a privilege to be running. Um, tens of thousands of people that are unable to run through disability or the like would kill to be in our position. So you know, love the journey, love the process. We're changing ourselves from the inside out, from a physiological stance, from a psychological stance. So it's a beautiful thing. And just be bloody grateful that we can run a, and train for a marathon. Yeah. And you'll definitely get better results if you have that frame of mind. I think um, practicing gratitude is so, so important. It's crucial when you do have um, like low moments, if you have to be out in the, the middle of winter in the rain or maybe like an injury arises, it's like practicing gratitude is so, so key. And a lot of the, the elites, a lot of the top performance, like sports athletes, they all practice gratitude and they all know how grateful it is to be in the position they're in. And even if you have like a severe injury, Hey, like that, let's focus on some positives here. Let's, I can still go out and get fresh air. I can still, um, you know, egg people, egg everyone else on, at least I've learned from this experience. I've learned what not to do. All that kind of stuff um, can be crucial for recovery, but also for performance. So true. And to that point, Brody, uh, I think you might have had in your ebook, but I've always said every every running injury is a lesson, but also like, you're never going to be the same athlete again after injury. You're going to be stronger. So you're going to let's just say if the, if you do have an overuse injury, which is common, um, you, you go to someone like Brody, you get your strength program, and you become a better athlete because of that injury. So there's always silver linings. But exactly right, like we're just lucky to be here, aren't we? So um, enjoy the process. Do not make it a chore. Never make it a chore. Like like Brody said before, it's a you're not going to get anywhere making your training a chore. It's a, it's a privilege and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. 
Yeah. And it might require like a bit of self-reflection every now and then um, throughout your process. Cause you might catch yourself being like, Oh, actually I'm feeling a bit down Then the last week or two. Let me find, or let me implement things to mentally pick myself back up. Let me find a way to create a bit of variety and maybe start to um, enjoy the process a bit better. Maybe I change my running track. Maybe I just um, change some hills, maybe challenge myself in different ways. Um, that can be a pretty um, important step as well. Great tips. Um, look, if you, can, if you have got running partners, people on a bike, people that want to join you for 10K, 15K, people on a bike is a great way, like a partner or someone on a bike, your kids. Um, obviously, running groups are great for that, for long runs, even if they're different paces, like to spend an hour or so together. Um, if you are running on your own and you're finding the long runs really monotonous, just throwing in some, some strides or some fart leg efforts, like literally doing stuff like uh, 90 seconds at a quicker pace and, and four and a half minutes easy is a great way to look from a neurological point of view, really be able to stride out, but it also makes the time go really fast. So a few little tips there for the listeners. Yeah. And if you see someone, if you're feeling a bit down or if it's feeling a bit monotonous, like if someone's walking past you, say good morning and it's going to pick yourself up and you, yeah. Or just, um, I don't know, say something funny to someone you're walking past and they laugh and you laugh and then you feel energized straight away, which is a very good segue into, um, my last tip, which is especially going from a half marathon to a full marathon, you need to recognize the importance of mental strength. And I'm, I'm more talking about within the race and what, what you need to learn. Like you need to expect that times will get tough. You will get some low points within the race where you just feel depleted. You feel like you mentally can't do it. You, it's a big, big challenge. And like if you expect that and if you have a couple of like strategies to pick yourself back up that gives you an advantage over um the runner next to you so like coming up with some mind games and my i've done a podcast previous to this um called the everyday running legends and after every well everyone that i interviewed i asked them at the end what's your number one tip to help a runner who's struggling through the last 10 percent of uh, an endurance race and so this is like my forte. Like I'll come up with so many tips and tricks and things to, um, to help people to b- boost their, their energy levels and um, visualization is a key one. And my personal one is to start high-fiving people. If you're, if you're in like a, a race, if you're in a big marathon event, um, there's definitely going to be people like watching and cheering you on, um, taking that energy and start high-fiving people. And straight away, you're going to know that you're, um, your energy, your attitude, your alertness starts to increase and you just feel better and you'll find that the legs get less heavy and you um, kind of get that second wind. Um, do you have any, or do you have anything to add to that? Well, that's really well said personally, but yeah, uh, Kipchoge and all these good marathoners that, that literally smile for, um, for two hours, that there's, there's a lot of science in that. They've done a lot of science in that. I think it might've been the book we're speaking about off air endure or a similar book that we, um, they mentioned the actual science of smiling, um, during endurance feats and high fiving, just a nice, a a bit of a laugh or a nice smile with someone running past you is so important. Um, and two of the, a lot of the points we've already made, I think is about their visualizations really good. Um, and not, not treating it with a negative outlook, like just having a positive outlook on it all. Um, and just, yeah, not, it's not a chore. Um, one that works for me often Brody is not, yeah, not wishing the time away, not wishing the miles away. So let's say I'm running a marathon and I'm, I'm at 32 K and, um, if, if stuff hasn't gone right, the piano might jump on the back. Um, just pretending like I've got to run 50 K, um, and say, look, I'm going to get through 50 K today. Then, then 42.195 all of a sudden doesn't sound that. Uh, crazily bad so things like little things like that i'm sure there's lots of stuff but i I love your stuff about smiling laughing high-fiving because the neurotransmitters are going to be going off and which means our pain tolerance and our our, i guess our chore-like attitude won't be there yeah it's contagious as well if you start high-fiving or telling jokes or laughing um other runners start to feel that energy as well and it picks them up and no doubt if you say something or if you're a bit cheeky to a runner, they'll be a bit cheeky back and you kind of have a bit of banter back and forth. It's always good fun. And um, like back to your point before you, you're loving that process. Who, who wouldn't love that? And um, yeah, it, it helps with performance. It helps with you as a human being. It helps like you challenge yourself and um, yeah, you're just loving the experience. 
like, like I said, the marathon's a great metaphor for life. Um, and look, it's just one of the greatest places on earth when you've got a few thousand runners in the one spot, um, whether they're running 210 or, or six hours, it's irrelevant. Uh, everyone's equal. And it's uh, the finish line is, is a great spot as well. But just like being out on that road with a couple of thousand like-minded people, just trying to be something better, just trying to improve and, and trying to do something special uh, is, is a pretty, pretty cool thing. Jeez, the, the, the value of this podcast has been immense. Um, do you have anything, any final comments or anything to add before we finish up? Uh, not, not, not really on that. But yeah, thanks for it. Look, it's been a good way to collaborate. We'll, this will be on both our pods, which I'm sure we'll talk about in the intro. But yeah, it's great, great what you're doing, mate. The, um, the PDF or the book, sorry, the ebook is fantastic. And, and I really think um, that kind of stuff is going to help people be continuous. But my biggest thing is just to enjoy, enjoy your running, um, enjoy, enjoy just moving because it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. And, and yeah, let's, uh, let's all get around each other and, and help each other through. Yeah, fantastic. And thanks for reading the ebook as well. I, I, I love this, uh, this style of podcast episode where we're just firing value back and forth and kind of collaborating, learning off each other as well. And um, it, it tremendously adds to the value that the, the audience is listening to. So um, yeah, let's finish up there. I loved having you on. We'll uh, most likely do it again in the future. Can't wait, bros. We'll chat in a few months. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Running Smarter Podcast. I hope you can see the impact this content will have on your future running. If you want to continue expanding your knowledge, please subscribe to the podcast and keep listening. If you want to learn quicker, jump into the Facebook group titled Become a Smarter Runner. If you want tailored education and physio rehab, you can personally work with me at breakthroughrunning.physio. Thank you so much once again. And remember, knowledge is power.